Afternoon, Tim. Thanks for joining the podcast. Appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. The um, so as I said before, we kind of started recording. We don't want to waste all this valuable content that we're talking about before we start recording. But um, as we kind of spoke before we joined, you guys are going through a bit of transition from one phase to the next with structure flow. Obviously, you've had the new addition of a your CRO. Like how um, it'd be great to obviously get a bit of background with regards to you guys, like how you kind of see yourselves developing and we can get into it from there if that works for you, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, we, we're, we're in a kind of inflection point, I guess. Um, we uh, we started the business uh, back in 2018, um, mm-hmm. got product into market in 2020 and have been working uh, hard to uh, build traction and um, get, our, uh, get our client book um yeah and uh i've had a wonderful team with me on the journey um since the beginning um but now we're at a point where we're beginning to scale and really you need to bring in people that have done this before yeah um because i haven't done it before <laughs> uh and um bring in people that can support you and just have a have an instinctive uh, knowledge about actually how do you go about building this business out from here on so yeah we just had uh super exciting um with our new CRO Fiona McLoon joining and new COO Jerry McHugh joining um and uh yeah it's ma- already making a massive impact so so what what's your background right so were you, were you a lawyer like how, how did kind of structure flow kind of where was it conceived from yeah, I was a lawyer. I was a corporate lawyer, M and A lawyer. Uh, okay. For your sins, and right? For my sins, yeah. <laughs> for my sins, actually, I I really enjoyed being a lawyer. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> is I that is it. that for sure in sort of uh, yeah. Dowsy, uh, yeah. Or... <laughs> well, you know, I used to um, many moons ago. I used to sell M and A data rooms. So um, mm-hmm. so I used to work like. Well, I'm sure you know, like data site and intralinks and these kind of guys. And so I used to spend many a penny with a slaughter and May MA lawyer. So um I do know some of the war stories, but um it's just good you enjoyed it. Like MA is quite cool, right? Yeah, there is there's a certain uh excitement Panache. that comes yeah. with the deal. Yeah. But there's also I think what I enjoyed there's also some of the technicality around it as well. There was sort of mm-hmm. combination of being um there was a bit of drama to it. Uh you know, I'm not talking about kind of uh, uh, box office, kind of Hollywood uh, drama. Often it yeah. definitely wasn't that. Um, but, you know, there was there was some cut and thrust. And and that was combined with actually quite a sort of technical um, uh, a need to be uh, you know, very much on top of the detail and, and be technical about how the way you did things. So, yeah, I did enjoy it. Um, I, uh, I, I I had the idea for structure flow while I was a, a corporate lawyer. Um, okay. And it and it kind of ba- it basically all came from me trying to work and think and communicate more visually as a lawyer because it's a world that is dominated by mountains and mountains of dense text. Yeah, um, especially I, due diligence, right? It's all documents, contracts, letters of intent, all that kind of fun stuff, right? Ab- absolutely. I mean, the you know the original data room, right, was actually a room. They, yeah, uh, probably probably a sort of cupboard like dark room with no natural light um stuffed full of a whole load of files with lots and lots of quite dry documentation mhm yeah um and you know and part of my job as a lawyer was to read a lot of information um process it absorb it and um and actually my output was often a lot of written documentation as well um but i saw this this kind of power that visualization had in that world to be able to cut through the complexity and arrive at something that was simpler to understand, simpler to communicate. Mm-hmm. And going back to school and university, I'd, I'd been using timelines and mind maps. I, I studied okay. history at university, have a, have a love of history generally. And then when I went to law school, I started seeing structure diagrams, structure charts, being used to explain legal concepts and and transactions. And then when I went into practice at Slaughter's, I started seeing them being used in practice. And then it 
it kind of became a USP for me as a junior lawyer trying to stand out from the crowd with an intake of 90 trainees. Um, yeah, it okay. became something that I saw as, as, as a really valuable, useful way of being able to, to work not only just internally with your colleagues, but also with your, with your clients. Makes sense. So how, how so how do you make the jump? Cause some people do it from M and a corporate lawyer to trendy legal tech leader right how, how how does that transition work well for me it it it, it happened very uh it was a surprise mm. <laughs> like um, all good things right i yeah i didn't I, I never saw myself doing what i'm doing now um if you'd asked me 10 years ago uh would i be doing this so i would i would not have seen it coming um for me it, it was a kind of a number of factors that all came together um I started to get interested in legal technology generally, kind of around about 2015, 16. I went to yeah. the first uh, legal geek conference at Truman Brewery. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I had been doing, I, I'd moved on from Slaughter's at that point. I'd, okay. I'd moved to Farrer and & Co. And I was, yep. I was doing corporate work there, but it was a different type of client base, less large corporate, small management teams, entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, and I'd started doing quite a bit of work for early stage companies, capital raising, seed yeah, nice. stage, series A stage. And so I'd seen people that had experienced problems in other domains and had teamed up with technologists to solve them. And I saw how that process had worked and I'd seen the impact that they had on those different areas, most of it kind of more in the fintech space. Mm-hmm. And so I was looking at that and I was looking at legal technology and I was like, this is this is kind of interesting. There's so much potential in the legal space to disrupt and yeah. do that in a in a tran- in a in a positive transformational way. And and then I had this kind of passion around this this problem space of you know the frustration of not being able to easily work and communicate visually because the only thing you had to do that was PowerPoint. And um that's where that's really where it started and it and if 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 you ask my wife it, it, it kind of started as a hobby yeah uh, an interest and then it was kind of just it was there and it and it and it sort of then became obsessive and then i you know i i i remember quite clearly it was one summer uh one summer's evening going for a run and sort of coming back and being and this is kind of it sounds ridiculous uh because it's kind of such a stereotype of being in the shower and the kind of penny drop dropping in my mind and thinking, you know what, actually there is an opportunity here to do something mm-hmm. really quite significant. And if I don't do this, someone else will. And if I read about that one day, that oh, yeah. someone else did this and I'd lost that opportunity, I, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Um, and that's, and that's really, that's really how it started. Um, so yeah, I, I I then started spending evenings and weekends working on what is now structure flow. So interesting, right? Because like, do, I suppose my question to you is: Do you think that lawyers make good leaders? Right? Because I think we, um, well, I've worked with lawyers for like twenty years now. Um, there's some phenomenal lawyers out there. I think sometimes they have a propensity to kind of overthink a situation, um, mm. c- c- hyper analyze. Which obviously has good and bad points. Sometimes that obviously um, is a blocker to momentum and moving forward. Like, mm. how how did you kind of get over perhaps some of those traditional lawyer hangups, right? When it comes to being kind of a technology founder, because you have to be dynamic and pivot and change and be quick and accept that not everything's going to be perfect. Was was that some of the things that you had to overcome? Was it quite easy? Like, how did you come across those things? Yeah, I mean, the stereotype is that lawyers are kind of risk averse and yeah. um, details orientated and um, small c conservative. Um, and you know, I, I guess opening point is that there's a lot of different types of lawyer out sure. there. And if you look at a law firm, if you look at the top law firms, if you look at the the array of people that they've got in them, some people are actually very dynamic and mm-hmm. um, and commercial and business orientated. Some people are more details orientated. Some people really, you know, get a kick out of being in the weeds of the documents. Um, and some people, some really remarkable people can actually straddle both of them. 
Is this um, where you go? And that's where I come in. <laughs> well, no, uh, okay. <laughs> no. But I think there is there is there there are there are lawyers out there who who are able to be commercial, yeah. and I think your question originally was around leadership, right? Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, rather than sort of entre just entrepreneur on being an entrepreneur god it's a mouthful isn't it entrepreneurialism Entre yeah. um, <laughs> um i mean i'm learning about leadership okay. now we're at 20 people i've got you know with the recent uh hires that i've made i've got some fantastic talent that's just joined you know what makes me qualified to lead those people when they've done it before and i haven't right mm -hmm. Um, and I think actually law firms probably aren't that good at teaching you about leadership because um, as you're a junior associate and then working your way up through to partnership, you're typically involved in running or working with quite small teams. Yeah. Um, and I think there is something uh, there is something to that. I mean, what, one, of, one of the things you have to do as a founder is attract people to you and you have to communicate your vision and your passion and you need to get them to buy in. So you, you quite quickly need to learn how to sell, like sell in a ideas sense. You need to be able to do that. And um, but then you need to you need to also then work out like how do you these people that join you, how do you how do you get the most out of these people? Um and uh and that and that and and there's there's so much to that. There's the you know, the psychology um of working with people and aligning them and um, incentivizing them and engaging them and making them feel like they have um, they have meaning in what they yeah. do. That's very hard. And it, when I say it at that abstract level, it all sounds very wishy-washy, but it, it is something that I'm facing on a, on a, on a daily mm -hmm. basis. Yeah, it makes sense, right? The, um, like for me, like the best leaders that I've worked with is they purely are there to get things out of the way that, that of the people that they've hired right so for example your heads of your cro's you've kind of you've employed them to execute on something you want them to do and like i think leaders who can't get in get out of the way of themselves kind of impede these people from uh being their best self right because you're just like no i know better but then these people get disgruntled so that's probably the hardest thing right is to get out of people's way and let them perform right Absolutely. Um, I mean, what what you're doing is you're you're building a company, not just a product. Yeah. And in order to do that, you need to you need to build um, something that can operate autonomously, and you need to hire people in that can operate autonomously. And if you've done your hiring right, you should be able to trust them. And if you can do that, if you can let go, let people take ownership of things and run with it. That's how you then start to get into scalability as well, because mm -hmm. it, it, it is at a small stage, like where we've been and where we're up to now. Yeah, I could be across everything and I could be trying to do everything. But we're now at, simply at a stage where I can't do that. I, I have to let go. How did you um, how did you find hiring initially? Because I've done it before. I find it really hard. <laughs> right. Did um, Because obviously you you move from it being your idea in the shower, your baby, and you're kind of inviting people in to be part of that process. Did did you find it quite difficult to bring people in, let go a little bit, or did you find that quite easy? Like, how did you find it? Yeah, I mean, it's it it it's it's been a new experience for me. I've I've gone through two quite uh, structured processes, yeah. um, and I had to. I mean, this is where actually being a lawyer is. It does sort of come back into play a little bit. I had to, I had to make sure that I really maximized the likelihood that I had found the right people. Yeah. Uh, accepting that there are limitations around, uh, you know, uh, budgets and type of people that you're mm -hmm. uh, that you're putting through the process, um, and where the company is right now. Um, I had to, I had I had to put in place a process where I I had the the the, the highest likelihood of, of of getting good people great people yep. in and not have to undo that or rewind 
Now, mm-hmm. I don't, <laughs> if our new CRO or COO is listening to this, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> I, I I don't know I don't know right now if I've uh, if I've one hundred percent definitely uh, achieved that or not, but I'm pretty yeah. damn confident that I have. Um, and I think uh, w- what has helped is that we really were systematic about the way that we went through that process. And I had a fantastic I had fantastic advice as well. We had a great uh, we had a great uh, recruitment consultant helping us. Um, and so I. I, I felt very confident about the way that that process was, was being run. Mm-hmm. And I, and, and therefore at the end of it, I felt very confident about the decisions that, that, that I made. Okay. That makes complete sense. And then if, I mean, if we pivot slightly to legal tech and the ecosystem, like you said, obviously this started in 2018 for you guys, have you seen like the, the adoption and also that bell curve in our market improve do do you still see frustration like how, how do you see our market at the moment from a legal tech perspective well i'm i'm pretty bullish actually i i, I think we're 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 in a I, I think probably a quite unique period of history at the moment okay. i think people Bold are going to look back Tim. Bold yeah well I, I but I think it's true. I think ten years from now, people will look back on the period, probably from the start of COVID. They'll probably run it from COVID, and everything that had to happen in terms of investment in technology that could facilitate remote working. Yeah. Um, and I think then they'll be looking at what's happening at, mom- at the moment with artificial intelligence um, as an accelerator. And I think the period probably twenty twenty up to maybe the next five ten years. Uh, we're going to see some really transformational change happen in the legal industry. Mm-hmm. And I think we're very lucky, all of us, to be part of this, because while I think there's always going to be continual improvement thereafter, I think if you look at the uh, the intensity and the pace of change, I think people will look back at this period and actually genuinely say there was a revolution in legal industry in this period. It's bold. Well, but the um, do you think that's because I always think that adoption of technology actually comes from the individual's adoption of technology in their private life, right? So, like, I don't like if we didn't have these, I actually think technology in corporate life would be a lot slower. Um, and it's sometimes I'm sure you get this as well. I've sold technologies in the past, and you kind of show them the search, and they're like it's not Google. I'm like, well, we haven't spent $8 billion on the search functionality in this tool. Right. So it's so tricky. Like you have this, sometimes you have these people, well, I'm going to call them laggards just for the benefit. It's not a great name, but like people who are slow to adopt technology, but expectations so high. And then you just need to kind of get that first wave of people adopting the tools, especially when you're kind of selling to like law firms as well. Right. Like, um, is you kind of need those kind of initial entrepreneurist people to kind of take a, like a punt, but like a go at it, right? And then people mm. slowly see over your shoulder, like, oh, what's that thing you're using? That looks cool. And then it kind of snowballs from that. So do, do you do you guys particularly focus on law firm, corporate, both? Like what what's what's the uh, target market for structure folk? Yeah, uh, our market focuses law firms right okay. now, but we, yeah. we believe that there is a... A, a much wider market opportunity out there and we we are selling to some extent into into the corporate in-house um side of the ecosystem as well mm-hmm. um but to your to your point uh you got your phone out there um i think there is something really really significant in that i think the world uh, that we're living in um we have become accustomed to having fantastic new technology uh mm-hmm empower us in our daily lives and then that does connect into what you do in your in your in your professional life as well um and you want to be able to use technology that empowers you in the same way and there's a lot there's been a lot of catching up to do in the legal space i think other sure. industries you know have been um have, have especially in professional services management consulting investment banking to some extent a lot of other industries have been using technology um better um and earlier than the legal space i think that's changing though now in a big way and 
you know, your question, I think part of it was also getting at uh, kind of that bell curve and um, sort of how you how you establish traction. And um, I think there is something in our space around uh, startup businesses like ours. Yeah. And in our case, putting putting something into the market that didn't exist before is uh, it, it is a new category uh, in in our in our space. Um, what we've had to do is find organizations that that have a partnership mentality, okay, yeah. not just a consumer mentality, but a partnership mentality, and can look at you as a technology vendor and buy into you as a team as a long-term partner and not just where the product is now but where it is going to go and that has been super important to our growth journey um i think and i, and I, I think a lot of these law firms you've got to give them credit because um there is this and has been this kind of david and goliath type uh dynamic where you've got you know big law um with major clients with super sensitive information, potentially market moving information, that if it if there was a breach and and that data got out, it would be you know disastrous for them, disastrous disastrous for their clients. Yeah. But they have they have been very prepared to work with early stage businesses like us to bring in new technologies and partner with us and ensure that we're doing things properly and that we are security first and security conscious. And help us to develop our products and actually this there is a really nice story there around how those how those partnerships have played out we you know it's not it, it's not just structure flow you could you know you can look at a, a, a large number of, uh, of really successful legal technology businesses now in the market and you can see that they've had fantastic partnerships with you know in some cases law firms that have been established for hundreds of years uh, it, it it is quite something I think we, we live in a really interesting ecosystem, right? Between uh, technology to corporate to law firm. And effectively, we have this, I kind of coin it as like an innovation cycle, right? So the corporates demand innovation from the firms that they work with, right? Um, and then the firms to kind of prove the innovation need to invest in technology partners to prove out the innovation. And then effectively in some technology examples the technology is actually just a pass through to the end client right so for example if you're talking like an m a dace room it's not always the bank or the law firm that are procuring that tool it's just a recommendation to the end client but because obviously yeah. end client perhaps is just doing this deal once in their lifetime they don't need a subscription for an m a dace room same as like e-discovery right on disclosure it's like the law firm aren't always buying or procuring the tool it's whoever's getting the piece of litigation against them or for and so you have this kind of ecosystem of innovation, technology, growth, progression. And I think and I think it's great because everyone's kind of holding everyone accountable. So now you see law firms who have been doing it for a while. So you get like Fuse and you get MDR Labs. Um, forgive me, I know Sorcerer sure may have one. I can't, the name slips my mind. But again, you have these innovation centers within law firms to progress technology and we've seen some great ones come through those things right so it's interesting where we're going to go next on that absolutely it is an ecosystem and my david and goliath metaphor just then probably isn't right because you know david and goliath were uh fighting each other yeah um but you you know it, it's it's it, it, it's 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 collaboration really um which actually uh bizarrely it, that collaborate is the name of the sort of remain program um, there we go there you go there you Perfect. go <laughs> it's really interesting yeah so where do you my last question is like where like quite often technologies start or and are born and then over the years they progress into something else like where where's kind of your objective for structure flow like obviously perhaps never ending but like wh where where would you like to kind of get it to in kind of the next kind of iterations of the platform sure well it is connecting the ecosystem together mm -hmm. so transactions deals their team sport yeah there's multiple different teams um and m a deal has buy side sell side then you've got the advisors on each side legal being part of that tax accounting investment banking 
yeah. um, all of these different participants need to come together and they need to transact. And what we're doing is creating a platform that can connect people together and can visualize the information relevant to the deal and the workflow relevant to the deal and can connect them in a way that hasn't until now been possible. And that's really the vision for structure flow is that um, we move beyond just chart creation. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we're not just creating diagrams or charts. This is not PowerPoint mark two or three or four this is a digital data-driven modeling platform for corporate deals that connects all the different stakeholders together and gives them a common reference point and a common way of working that's super super important and that was always part of the vision that i had when i look when i go back and i think when i was kind of putting those diagrams together in powerpoint moving squares and lines around yeah that was frustrating like mm -hmm. that you know that that was painful and there was a need to improve on that and create something else but then i look at the output and it's just a flat two-dimensional diagram there's no connectivity into the underlying data yeah and then the collaboration experience around that is extremely poor putting that onto a pdf and emailing it uh, getting comments back via email and repeat 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 all of that that's that's not the future. We need to build something that uh, brings all those different parties together, allows them to manipulate that common data set together, that allows them to create that visual interface into that that data together. Because that that's fundamentally what we're doing. We're creating a visual interface into into deal information. I think um, probably the key word is being dy dynamic, right? So like all of these traditional things like powerpoint pdf it's it's just a shot in time right whereas like i think a lot of the technologies are enable a dynamic process for deal structure right so even like again in previous lives i've worked with like deal crms like mm -hmm. uh, deal cloud and uh, dynamics have one and there's a couple and um, salesforce is that they, they're kind of the objective to try and enable a dynamic way of looking at a re not just a report, but the actual detail, the data. And of course, like I'm sure you guys work on that is like time kills deals, right? So like, how can you reduce the time of transacting? Because again, we haven't got enough time to talk about the hourly rate for a lawyer, but like the longer a deal goes on, the more the chance there is collapse and costs expediting, right? Absolutely, 100%. And the ultimate end, end game for us, it's not about creating diagrams faster. It's about doing deals faster. Mm -hmm. And it's about doing deals in a way where, I mean, it, it's about design, design thinking, uh, planning what you want to do, uh, front loading the, well, if we do this, doesn't that connect into that? And making sure that before you actually dive into the detail and into the documentation, you've already got very strong solid idea of what you're going to do and if you do that then you're going to also remove the risk that you haven't thought about something that could then extend the timeline i mean i, I personally can think of a number of deals i worked on where you can see the finishing line in sight and then someone goes ah, what, about <laughs> yeah. what about this right and then it's like oh, i'm sorry guys we're gonna to have to work like probably the next three or four weekends and the deal's been like uh punted out until like the next quarter and the client's not happy and the lawyers are not happy because their life has just been ruined. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. No, it's, 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 re it's really, in it's a really interesting part of the market, right? Because I also, and I think what you guys are doing is so good because I actually think that the deal portion of the market gets a little bit forgotten about when it comes to the legal tech ecosystem, because it is really like, matter management contract management workflow like and it's perhaps like that enterprise elongated cycle that actually mm. and this like deals and m a and the data in peace and you, what you guys are doing like where do you roll up to right like do you roll up into legal tech do you roll up into like a deal tech or a fintech like it's tricky right where to see where you sit in that ecosystem 
personally, I like deal tech as a concept. And I, yeah. I also like to talk about the deal tech stack mm -hmm. as a concept. And I think, you know, deals are, deals are dynamic. And actually, that's where a lot of the value creation is, is where you've got transactional activity. And that actually means that the people or the, the, the organizations, the products which are involved in that space, because the value is there, actually, there's a huge amount of value to be tapped as a provider of a solution or a service in that space. I mean, the law firms know this because you know, they've been fueled by this you know, uh, for decades, you know, mm. high ticket M&A deals, that's, that's where the juicy work is, because that's, that's where the fees are, right. And um, I think, uh, I think there has been a lot of, there's been a lot of focus on areas which are more static, as in they, there are a lot of systems of record, contract management, what your uh, entity management, what they are essentially as systems of record, they, they are a snapshot of where, state of things are at a particular point of time whereas if you look at data room or um what we're doing uh the transaction modeling um you are you are taking a start state and you are working out how you can through a process of change create a desired end state it's a dynamic process yeah i mean we could go, we could keep on going on for it forever because i think it's really interesting that it's interesting about tech adoption in that space as well, because I, I think a lot of it perhaps is driven by corporates and transact because of the nature of transactional events, that corporate might not be around to do multiple transactions. So mm -hmm. like the expectation of technology enablement is probably lighter, right? And so you kind mm -hmm. of do need the bankers and the lawyers to take the front foot to be like, we should be enabling ourselves through technology to improve the deal process. Whereas perhaps that, energy or impetus from doesn't perhaps come from the corporate where it perhaps does in other lighter trend like event-based um, things like a litigation or a DSAR or something like that right absolutely and I'd say also here like you know um, at a time where you know perhaps our national confidence is not as high as it has been in the past actually yeah. you know you 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 look at the UK uh, and Europe um, a lot of techn technologies in, in Europe as well. And I think there has been a huge amount of innovation in that space coming from this part of the world um, versus the US. I think, you know, the, 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 the US, the data room kind of uh, scene, uh, virtual data rooms, um, e-discovery, you know, huge amount of, uh, of innovation there historically. Um, but I think over the over the last few years, we've really seen this kind of ballooning of um, of, of innovation in in that space in UK and Europe. I think the US now, by the way, my sense is that the US is now really firing up. I think there's a you know I I, I am seeing a lot of um, I'm seeing a lot of uh, forward thinking young lawyers coming out mm. of practice in some of those big firms in New York and addressing a huge array of different problem areas. Um, and I think the U I think the US scene is, is about to start really firing. Um, but I think right now, if you look at our our world over here, um, you know, Truman Brewery, Spitalfields, you know, that part, that part of the world, there's been a huge amount of innovation in a very short sp space of time. Yeah, it's super exciting for our world. The um again. We won't get into common law, civil law, proportionality and all that kind of fun stuff because it's not too jazzy for a podcast. But Tim, thank you very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure coming on, Rob. And uh, yeah, I wish you all the best with this going forwards. Thank you, sir.